All right, now it looks like we are live. So, uh, hey folks, welcome to the Battles of the First World War podcast. Returning to the show today are Mr. Andy Robertshaw and Mr. Ross Barnwell to talk about a new project that promises to bring history not only alive, but interconnected with today's global world. This episode is being recorded for audio and video, so you'll be able to see the recording of this video through the podcast website, firstworldwarpodcast.com, the podcast's YouTube channel, and through the SEMA website, sema.education. Mr. Robert Shaw is a former teacher turned historian and historical consultant for such films as Peter Jackson's They Shall Not Grow Old and Sam Mendes' recent hit 1917. Ross Barnwell is the creative force behind 8,000 Foot Media, which produced the short film Beaumont Amel, named after the infamous village on the 1916 Somme battlefield. The film focused on wartime cinematographer Jeffrey Mallon's experiences as he took 8,000 feet of frontline footage on the Somme, the most famous of which is the explosion of the Hawthorne Ridge Mine on the morning of the 1st of July, 1916. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you on again. And I've given you both a very brief introduction, so please feel free to tell us a bit more about yourselves. It's great having an introduction from you, Mike, really, because often I find I have to uh, you know, write a bit of a paragraph about what I do and, and things like that if it's going in a magazine or something. And you think, well, where, what do I say? I say, where do I start? So I've done a lot of things, but it's more, what would be interesting? So thank you for doing that. Much appreciated. Yeah, you got it. Absolutely. Um, for, for me, it's very strange because my job is so varied. Uh, I've just done a Google Meet lecture for the Norwegian military on uh, the flu pandemic of 1918 to, to um, 1920. Um, as part of their training. And I'm thinking, but I'm not a doctor. How the hell do I end up doing this? I mean, there's a whole thesis in that, isn't there, really? Yeah. I mean, particularly now, I wonder how much um, uh, how, how much that's generated of interest of the flu pandemic of uh, or the Spanish influenza pandemic of 1919 to, what was it, 18 yeah. to 1920, wasn't it? It's... Well, well uh, just to say very quickly, it actually starts in 1916 in France, in a British camp, uh, it then actually goes to the US, comes back and dies out in 1920. It has nothing to do with either Spain or China, but there we are. <laughs> right. It was it was actually due to. Um, and I think you mentioned this sir, back uh, back yeah. when we spoke about a week ago. It was it was so Spain didn't have the, the wartime censorship. Correct. So they reported on it and yeah. then they got the label of it. Well, yes. there it is. It's the there it is. Yeah. you guys are yeah. talking about it. So. Yeah. So, wow, that's pretty, pretty unfair. Um, Another string to my bow, you know. That's, that's excellent. I, um, I Just don't let them do any licensed operations. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I will say I, 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 I'm looking for like the silver lining and, you know, the parallels with our current pandemic situation. And, um, you know, while, while the flu pandemic was going on just post-war and in the early 20s, um, I do tell my family, like, you know what, though, like, you, there are a lot of pictures from the late 1920s of all um, the British veterans visiting um, the, you know, the, the former battlefield yeah. uh, in the later 20s. So, yeah. um, so, you know, there, there is hope things, things will change. So if any of your listeners are interested in that yeah. early battlefield tourism of the 1920s. Um, my professor at university, uh, when I did my master's in First World War Studies at University of Kent, Mark Connolly, he has a wealth of knowledge and uh, material when it comes to uh, battlefield tours. And I think it's a fascinating subject for another time, but certainly worth a look. Um, he has some of the old Michelin guides of the 1920s talking about how you can take uh, you know, what roads to take, because of course some of them, most of them are still destroyed, you know, what roads you could take by car, and you know, it was a huge, the battlefield tourism isn't a recent thing, it's it's no. been going on, as I think, from, from November the 12th, 1918 onwards, almost. Okay. Well, I, I can probably beat you there, because the Royal Warwicks wrote a, a pamphlet, it was very rare, uh, all about, wait for it, their battlefield visit in March 1918 to their battlefield of the 1st of July, they actually went back um, to have a look and try and find uh, casualties and basically to explain what had happened. 
just before the Kaiserschlag. So there were battlefield tours going on during the war. One of the most famous ones is John Macefield's Old Front Line, yes. um, which he wrote in 1917, walking the old front line of July the 1st um, yeah. on the Somme, uh, whilst the war was still going on only a bit over horizon. Of course, only uh, a less than a year later, the war would pass back through where he was walking anyway. Right, right, right. Amazing. All right. So okay. shall we talk about um, the Center for Experimental Military Archaeology? SEMA. Um, so gentlemen, what, what is SEMA and, and what is its mission? Okay, um, well I'll start and then I'll pass over to Ross. Basically it, it, it's, it's centered on the Kent showground, um, which is run by the, the Kent Archaeological, uh, by the, the Kent uh, Agricultural Society, um, and uh, it, it's uh, an area basically between two roads that go to either Dover or Folkestone. So they're en route to the battlefields of the Western Front, but also the, the Second World War. Um, and the idea is to begin with some trenches, but then to examine the whole history of that area of England, which goes from basically a Roman signal tower through Mott and Bailey castles of the Normans, right up to the Second World War, dealing with the V1s. And it actually, the site features, would you believe, in the defense of the port of Chatham in case of German invasion in the First World War. The first sound mirror ever used to try and detect incoming aircraft is on site. It's, it, it's a fantastic area to be in. Uh, and we've got the opportunity to work on it for at least three years. Ross, Perhaps, what's the plan? Well, I would say then, uh, certainly when, it, when we say we're going to work on it, it, it's that we have to be quite broad in what we say because yeah. we have a whole wealth of ideas. And yeah. this comes from film crews that have already booked, uh, been booked in to start filming um, at our site and particularly in our new replica Great War Trenches, which we're going to talk about. Um, we've also then got Wessex Archaeology, um, who are uh, we're hoping to be able to come down and do some work with us, isn't that right, Andy? Yeah. Um, as as, uh, uh, oh, fantastic, there you go. Yeah, I didn't I did know how, how confirmed that was. There you go, an exclusive, yeah. I guess. Um, we've uh, we're hopefully going to, um, to have some partnerships with uh, universities, um, and so we can have research projects. There's all kinds of things. I mean, my, myself, I, I, uh, well, I guess my title is creative director, Andy, lead historian and director and then we also have Mark our third partner who's the business director so we all what's quite nice is that there's the three of us we all have our uh, own interests that yeah. surround history but going to Andy's point about the area of well, where we are for your listeners who maybe aren't particularly aware of where Kent is geographically in uh, the UK we're talking the southeast of England um, so south of the mouth of the River Thames okay. uh, a big county that then goes right round um, and um, is or features the shortest crossing point um, between France and England, Dover, Calais. Okay. Um, now, if you th just think about the amount of history that's passed through that county, I mean, it's incredible. Pretty much any 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 historical event that has happened to Britain, particularly sort of in a European setting, you know, it, it has to have passed through Kent or often had to have passed through Kent in order to get there. And I think that's what's so fascinating. I mean, I, you know, Andy has uh, such a, a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the, these various eras of history. And it's been fantastic, particularly in our initial research, um, where you were just hitting period after period after period and not only saying, there was history there's a bit of history here as if we could say there was a roman watchtower here and then there was a uh, uh well there was a civil war um battle not too far away was there and you know yeah. it's incredible and i i find all of that um fascinating as well and, and thanks for for telling us where where exactly it is so um you said um southeast southeastern england yeah. okay um so yeah so i know um uh yes i was going to say um I basically had to confirm where Kent was uh, in, in between us us talking here, and I was super proud of myself because I I know a few places um, in England, but mainly it's it's London, having been there a couple of years ago, yep. and um, I can find Birmingham on the map because that's where, <laughs> that's where the the Peaky Blinders are from. So I'm a huge fan. Oh, of they put it. <laughs> well, you see, we, we'll hopefully have the Peaky Blinders effect with Kent. We'll put Kent on the map. 
<laughs> for, for people. So oh, this is great. Um, so uh, there's so Dover and in Folkestone were those. So as as you say, like like Dover. Um, just to go off topic briefly, yeah. like Dover is 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 um, the the English side, obviously, and, and it's and as you said, it's it's at the shortest point to France. Yeah. So with Dover and Folkestone, I've. I've heard Folkestone come up a lot. Were those major like em embarkation points like for the front or were they? Yeah, right. D Dover was very much Royal Navy. Um, Folkestone was embarkation for uh, ferries taking people to either Calais or Boulogne. There were the two areas they went to. Um, and there's a big project in Folkestone called Project Step Short. There's a very steep road down to the quayside and the soldiers rather than marching properly would step short so they didn't fall over um, and there's now a commemorative arch remembering all those soldiers that went down that steep road and didn't come back um, and uh, looking at it um, oddly my grandfather didn't go that route he went the, the Southampton to uh, uh, La Havre route but I would think 50% of our soldiers went that way from an aesthetic point of view as well, on a clear day, you can see France from Dover. Yeah. Can't yeah. you? And, you and know, of course, you're, you're clearly, uh, it, it's it's backed by the white cliffs, which is the, the, the thing that's iconic, you know. Awesome. So how did, how did the idea for for SEMA come about? And I, I, I had a follow on question here. Why did you choose this particular site? But I, I think we have the answer to that part. I mean, it's already <laughs> historically yeah, yeah. rich area. Yeah. But so well, we were fortunate, though, weren't we? Because we checked a few sites before we decided on where to go, didn't we, Andy? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we, what we had done, we, we'd I built a, a site on a piece of ground, a piece of land next to where I, I, I used to live um, if, in another county in Surrey. Um, the newspapers said it was in my backyard, which it never was, but it, it made better reading. For your uh, listeners, then, Google, Google man builds trench and garden, OK? Yeah, you'll, you'll find it. <laughs> Um, I'll do that. I, I, the, the key thing is then built another one uh, in another county and then the landowner had a heart attack um, and then we were looking for locations and I tried castles around here, I tried various locations and nothing doing and then I tried the, the Kent showground and just over a year ago now, almost exactly a year ago, Ross, you and I went and visited and then there was the lockdown and we really thought that was the end of it. But no, they were very, very keen. So that was the great thing. It was great because what was initially, I, I, I've always worked with Andy in, in one sense or another, and um, particularly studying in Kent, being so local, um, it was great to just be able to go about with Andy and have a look at these different sites. Uh, and certainly we, we realised there is uh, a good way of, of, of getting some revenue in is through film companies. And particularly, you know, we take a lot of pride in thinking we could be able to provide historically accurate historical locations for yeah. film companies, which, which is great. Um, the, so Andy, you brought me along, didn't you, to, to assess these various locations yeah. that we were scouting from a more of a filmmaking point of view, uh, because issues in the past, and this is just through essentially trial and error of Andy, you building various trenches uh, over the past 10 years, uh, it's an expensive hobby, um, is, well, your first one was under a flight path, yeah. a major flight path. So every 30 seconds, you would have the roar of a jet engine overhead. So <laughs> film companies would do scenes in 30 second bursts where yeah. actors would be speaking twice as fast as they should be and things. Right, okay, so that right, next trench, not under a flight path, good. Okay, so next trench, not under a flight path, but then there was it was built right up against, because of the piece of land that there was available, the trees were hanging right over into the trench. And yeah. although I, 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 I dislike it when people, uh, like to try and make the point that not a, not a tree existed in the first world war battle on a first world war battlefield when of course you know that isn't true and again something we might talk about in a bit is is what we're basing yeah. our trench system on which is uh called railway wood and eat um but cool. yeah but of course at the same time this trench system had you know branches and beautiful green branches um hanging over into the trenches and if anyone wants to watch my film Beaumont Hamill which I'll make available on our website and through your websites as well Mike um or I say my film our film Andy and um you, you will see that although we were very proud of the film one of the big drawbacks is the fact that it's this beautiful lush landscape uh right right next to us 
So yes, we found Kent Showground, the perfect place for many reasons. Uh, so we've got, um, so you guys have already alluded to a bit like like working with film companies and everything. Yeah. So what like what is your, I guess to just articulate or re-articulate, um, what is the, the vision for the site? So like um, a year from now, even two to five years from now, what do you, what do you hope that the Center for Experimental Military Ar Archaeology will, will be? I get, well, apart from kind of uh, uh, events that we run, which will be throughout the year, there will also be the opportunity to have a variety of military structures that people can explore as part of a circular tour, probably guided. Um, we're, we're looking at building, wait for it, uh, 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 if we can, a, a Roman signal tower and trying it out, seeing you know just how you, you send signals. Um, we're thinking about building a little chunk of a mott and bailey, um, which is the, the mound is called a mott. Uh, and we know from other research that's been done, it's not just a pile of dirt, it's, it's cleverly laid out using uh, uh, basically wooden um, platforms within it, the structure. Well, no one's built one of those since you know, uh, the, 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 the 11th century. So wouldn't it be great to see how that works certainly case and then we, what we really want to do is to build a piece of siege works basically 17th century 16th century through to the 19th century those earthworks getting you close to the enemy uh, and if you look at the, the the siege works that were built for example at, at Vicksburg or were built at Richmond that's the thing the gabions the baskets full of earth the fascines the bundles of, uh, of, of timber protection we want to build that to show how things have changed right up to the first world war and reflect the entire period and then of course it might provide a whole variety of different film locations as well well this is the trajectory i think it that reflects what, what's been going on for the past 10 years with your various sites andy is you initially built your trenches in 2012 in order to make a piece of experimental archaeology for a book that you're writing 24-hour trench uh, and then I turned up as a film student and went, wow, look at this place, <laughs> look, look at what we could do with films. And then, of course, you know, I, I just happened to be fortunate to be the, one of the first uh, filmmakers there before you realise what you're sitting on, you know. So I took full advantage. And the next thing you know, you were getting all sorts of BBC and all kinds of film companies coming yeah. down to, uh, to do work. And so it, it's, I, I think, a similar process that we want to do with SEMA is we build... A structure we do military experimental military archaeology for the, the the sake of research experimentation for learning um but then we exploit it for the um uh, uh, poor use of word, the words but to then uh for almost more creative means so inviting film companies photographers students who are for one thing we want to run um school tours and I had a conversation with a teacher recently on Instagram um, and she said she was uh, very impressed with what, what's been going on. She's going to pass on when she goes back to school and things open up, she's going to pass on um, the information to the history department. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you very much. She, I said, what do you do? What do you teach? And she's a drama student, a uh, drama teacher. And she said her students, her year nine students, so about 14 years old, um, they have a module uh, based around the Great War. And so it's all of a sudden it's it, you think, oh, well, actually, we can invite history students for one thing. You can invite drama students and English students and to the humanities as a whole. And they can take all kinds of things from the site in various different ways. Yeah. I mean, one of the strange things about yesterday's meeting with Wessex Archaeology, who are a contracting group that, that do work ahead of developments, is that I didn't think this would come out of it. I think they, they would be interested in the archaeology in the area, they actually explained that they'd done archaeology um, on a military site in, in, in Wiltshire. They'd found lots of objects which are now in store. They would like to use the trench that we've dug with us to talk about the context in which those objects would, would, were dropped as part of training, because there are no trenches that you can go to that show what a training trench looked like. And we've built a training trench. So they're gonna produce these items that they dug up. I will then produce examples which are perfect. And we'll then talk about what life was like for a soldier 
training in the UK during the First World War. And that was something I didn't expect at the beginning of our 2.30 meeting yesterday. I mean, this is this is exactly what we want to do with the trench. So I mean, this is why you know we, we're very grateful to be on your podcast again. Although we're talking about all kinds of areas of history, this is where, in many ways, we started and have started now with SEMA is these replica Great War trenches. Um, it's is it, it's something particularly with whenever we run tours for kids, adults as well, but particularly with the kids who who. Uh, uh, find it struggle to hide their uh, their true feelings, you know, <laughs> struggle to play it cool. Um, it's just fantastic seeing, seeing kids really engage with history and learning in that way. I know it's quite cliche to say, but it, it, you know, running the tours, it's often, you know, not the most, uh, not not necessarily the highest achieving kids that engage as much as some of the other kids in the class. It's actually perhaps. Um, more of your the, the kids are perhaps more surprising who engage the most and who take away the most from it. I mean, Andy, as a teacher, you, you've noticed that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I took a, a group to, to a trench in, in weather that were proved to be absolutely appalling. Uh, and what was interesting is having got in the trench and, and got them, they're in their waterproofs and uh, they were working, they were actually filling sandbags and things. The kids were pointing out actually in a trench. The weather isn't as bad as it on the top because clearly you're out of the wind you you know although you're getting wet uh, and one of the kids for a little while um, basically hunkered down in the corner and pulled a, a hood up and said actually i could sleep here and i said that's exactly where a soldier would sleep and you could see that suddenly she got trench warfare it's not the over the top sequence we see in every movie it's just how you live in a hole in the ground Right, amazing. So that's so that's already that's providing this um, God, this 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 rich um, kind of whole uh, God, all multi sensory uh, experience for the kids. Absolutely, three dimensional. I think is a yeah, good way of explaining yeah. it, isn't it? Yeah, get kids that refuse to engage, particularly funnily enough, with building a sandbag wall. It sounds a bit odd, but what you get is is that you get kids participate in different ways and more than once we, we've got kids filling sandbags there's one kid holding the sandbag one kid's putting dirt into it but they're always full of dirt never sand um, then someone has to move them and then someone has to choose where they place them someone has to batter them flat I normally tell them to imagine that they're battering flat their math teacher that helps a lot um, and uh, what they then do is at the end of it the teacher will say we, we've never done a group activity like that. And, and I didn't know that, that, that uh, 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 um, John was so good at that kind of thing and, and that Sarah actually started directing. And it's quite different from a classroom experience. And I did that on one day with a group of kids with, with really quite difficult uh, uh, behavioral difficulties who were actually basically locked up. And then a, a group of high achieving kids and of all the things we did, the teachers commented on the sandbagging as something, as a group activity that the kids could do. They worked together and they could understand what the real experience was, quite clearly not doing it in the dark and not being shot at, but right. we can't get any closer than that. Wow. Wow. Not without health and safety getting in, no, uh, not. writing us a letter. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of the... Um, you often hear the teachers talking about right when we're back in class this is what we're going to do and one of the common um i guess lesson plans that they pair with trips to the trench site is um asking the kids to write a, a diary entry of a day in the life of a soldier based on what they've learned and what they've seen in the trench and you know god like i say um my my master's um uh, university of kent was fantastic and to be able to do sort of this uh, you know to, from an academic um, to come from 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 a non-academic background to be able to uh, look into the First World War in that sense um, is fantastic. The one thing you don't get is the the sights and the smells of walking through a trench system that we uh, we've dug. And um, I think this is why if, if if school groups, if people who are interested in the First World War, your listeners of any ages ever have the chance to come and visit us, please do, because you only need a day um, with us 
and and you'll realize that you can read all the books in the world but it is just seeing everything that you've read everything that you've imagined um brought to life in in some form or another is, is worthwhile I mean, one of the things that we had was early on when the press release went out a journalist picked it up and said that we were going to recreate the horror of war well we can't we can re recreate the living experience the, the the horror we have to leave to imagination but to be to be honest what you were talking about a moment ago about Bon Mahamel is that one of the features of that battle was that about 360 soldiers spent a night not in a trench but in a sunken lane before they went over the top and the year before last I was in that sunken lane with a group of school children and one of them said what would it smell like and I went well are you thinking about gas he went yeah there's no gas no one's using gas on the first of July okay are you thinking about shell fire? Yeah, I am. Okay, well, that doesn't matter because that's on the German line. It's not happening here. But I said, we have a situation where 360 men get into this lane just after midnight. They are there until 7.30. And in that time, they have their breakfast. Okay, they have their breakfast. They have their cups of tea. All right. There are no restrooms. So if you want to know what it smells like, and you can, you can hear the kids going, because they suddenly realize, hang on. It's 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 a, it's an open toilet. Is yeah. this area? You know, you know. Why would you want to leave the sunken lane? Well, I can think of a lot of good reasons why you might leave the sunken lane, as well as the whistle going. You know, and it's just doing that. And I know it's a bit like toilet humour, but unless you tackle it, people don't get a real understanding of the experience. And, and as Ross said, by the way, the sunken lane on the first of July uh, was covered in trees, uh, uh, which would not damage by shell fire. You know, an unexpected element of the war. What we're trying to do is not replace in any way the uh, more traditional means of learning nope. uh, and, and history uh, teaching. But what we're trying to do is supplement it. Um, and so that's, again, whether it's with the general public, whether it's with schools or indeed with more creative processes like film and photography, um, it's, it's adding to what we already know and trying to give something slightly different. So there, there's your pitch anyway. Can, yes. No, I, stick I, that I, on the footnotes. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. It's so, you know, the, um, just the experiences that, um, you know, students that you've taken on previous trips. Um, yep. and, and, you know, and that translates to other other visitors too, like being able to smell the earth, um, being yes. able to feel um, just the, that student saying, you know, hey, I, I could sleep here. Like, well, yeah. you know, that's what they did, you know, and, sure. and even I was even thinking like, um, you know, perhaps like some of my students might react this way of like, hey, what was it like filling sandbags for an hour? And, you know, they would probably say, well, it, it kind of sucks. Like, <laughs> yes, that's that it. Is correct. <laughs> that's the experience. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, one, one of the problems we suffer from in the UK, I don't think it's it's actually part of, of the problem of understanding the, the, the Great War in, in the US, is that in Britain, we've always taught, at least since the 60s, the war poets, people like Wilfred Owen, and their view of the war is, is very negative. Wilfred Owen dies, you, you can't get more negative than that. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the key thing is that, that, that I have in the past pointed out that if you take, um, let's, say, let's take three people. We, we, we take somebody who is a farm laborer from where I live now, he will do a seven day working week. He'll get time off to go to church on Sunday. He will have meat once a week. He will do a 12 hour working day. you got the idea, okay? Right. You've then got somebody who works in a mine, a colliery in South Yorkshire where I was born. He does a seven day working week. Uh, he does a 12 hour shift, eight hours if he's lucky. He may well go to work in the dark. He'll come back in the dark. He'll wear a helmet and he'll have a respirator in case of problems underground. He will have seen somebody die, you know, even if whatever age. Um, and they will have started there in their farm labouring or their mining at the age of 12 when they left school. OK, we then take a young man who goes to public school, who goes to university, who was then a private tutor in Biarritz. OK, you put three of them in a trench for five days and ask them at the end of it what they think of it. The one person who can articulate it is the guy who's been to Biarritz, who went to university. He's your war poet. And his view 
is entirely negative because prior to the war, he'd never had to do 12 hour shifts and do hard physical work and be in danger. So from, from, from my background, my, my, my grandfather served for three years, is that I think the war poets do us a disservice of the view of most people. Uh, we get a very selective view. And that's not to say I don't like war poetry. It's only that I think their view is a unique view. Right, right. That's that's something that I've um, uh, experienced myself, like in in viewing yeah. and, and just doing, you know, reading on the Great War all the time. Um, I pretty much started like when I was a, a teenager, like re reading a lot of like Wilfred Owen and Siegfried yeah. Sassoon. And now it's, you know, well, oh, well, everybody thought of the war that way. But then a a few years ago, I, I came across, uh, I believe it was an author who's who's you know, similar story to yourself. Like uh, his grandfather had served, and and he just his grandfather had said, like, you know, Wilfred Owen. I mean, w not all of us think that way. Like some of us, you know, I just looked at it as it was my job to do, and I I did it, and it's over, and and that's it. You know, like, but but it was like so not kind of. There's no. He wasn't approaching it with that that the way just like you said that that Wilfred Owen articulated it that it, um you know it's a very negative experience like these guys just hey it's what we had to do so so yeah. we went ahead and did it and, you know yeah, and so. my, my grandfather was asked why he volunteered uh, and he said cryptically to get the uniform off I think he meant go to war do the right thing stop the aggression by the Germans the occupation of most of Belgium, northern France, get them back to where they should be, and then he can come home and get on with his day job. But it's a job that he had to do. And I think a lot of people thought that. Right, right. Wow. So, so amazing. So I, I feel very jealous that Britain has um, the great war as part of their national curriculum. We we don't here in the US. It's a whole, <laughs> whole different experience for us. It's a, For us, it's, it's completely the, the forgotten yeah. war at this point. Um, so awesome. So I guess, um, again, you guys have spoken about like working with organizations, Wessex archaeology, a great, great development there. And I guess that question's already answered, uh, various film companies. Um, so how is, so you guys just recently broke ground. Am, am I correct on that? Or, or how, how, yes. how's, how's work Absolutely going? Right. Uh, um, I mean, Ross, is it what, 10 days ago now? We started? Yes. Well, it was, uh, so it's Easter break. Uh, all well, the past couple of weeks, it's been Easter break um, for people. So we've had our Easter weekends and bank holiday and things. So uh, we've made the most of that time. And, and particularly what with lockdown and no one being around, it meant um, we could socially distance and all the rest of it, um, get out there and start digging. Um, if you'd like for uh, anyone who's uh, watching this podcast rather than listening, sure. um, I can share some photos, although actually just looking now, Mike, sorry, you're, I'm, I can't share my screen. Uh, it's You'd need to enable me, but if, if perhaps if you want to, I'm just, essentially, I'm just showing my Instagram page. Um, yeah, let me see if I, I believe I've... Well, but while you're doing that, if I just say that what we've done uh, in the showground is we, we looked at the geology, um, we also then looked at its uh, position. It's a wood on a hilltop. And then we found a similar geology and a similar situation in near the, the city of Ypres, uh, wipers to British soldiers mm -hmm. in Belgium, and decided it matched pretty well with railway wood. And we very carefully laid our trenches out to match trenches, wait for it, called H20 and H21, and their junction with Wood Street, and we've laid out to, to match that. So what we're doing is we're recreating full size, a real piece of frontage with a nomad's land and then the Germans, that's what we're doing. That's stunning, that's stunning. Ross, you should have the permissions now, I believe. I do indeed, um, I will go on to it now. So uh, this is just from our Instagram account. I do encourage people to follow us if they're on Instagram, share lots of photos and videos of what we're up to and updates. So here uh, is actually from the old set of trenches. Um, what you'll see is one of the stark differences is the fact that here 
uh, is a lot of chalk. It's very bright white for those who are listening. Um, mm -hmm. I'm standing there. This is um, when we've been making our film Beaumont Hamill. I'm standing in a trench then with um, some of our great guys who, who are uh, dressed up. Uh, they're marked up as Royal Fusiliers, Second Royal Fusiliers there. Oh no, Lancashire Fusiliers there, aren't they, uh, Andy? And um, when we then look at the trench system that we've built now, uh, here is a cross section that we found. So again, for those who are listening, uh, it's a drone shot of a, um, a cross section of trench that we uncovered in a forest in, in uh, Kent showgrounds. Uh, did you want to go through our, yeah, our, our excitement it's here? certainly built, by the way, for paintballing. Because when we got there, it was full of tires, wasn't it? We had to move them. So we haven't destroyed an original bit of trench. This is a, a bit of 1990s work. When we first came to look at it, the, the, the Kent Showground called up Andy and said, oh, we found some Second World War trenches, because, of course, this was an airfield in the Second World War. Yeah, so okay. and and which we'll go on to talk about the fascinating story about it because of its position, its location uh, geographically, as explained, um, the Germans really gave it hell in 1940. Oh, wow. So, of course, there were trenches. And this is why we want to bring in Wessex archaeology, uh, we, you know, relatively soon is to get an idea of, you know, before we start um, cutting into places where um, we think there might be archaeology. Yeah. But yes, anyway, when we first came in just to look at this cross section of trench here, very excited. And we thought, hello, this is something very, very exciting. And then we, I were digging down and, and, and slowly going through the earth. And then there was a sort of a rusty little bottle of some sort. Like, oh, what's this? What? Anyway, yeah, it's just paintball. Paintball and clay pigeon all the way through. But of course, fortunately, what it did mean is that we could we, we um, developed then this small sort of shallow cross section of paintball trench into our trench system. Yeah. Um, here is uh, a little set piece of our friend and colleague Pete sitting on a fire step. Um, again, I encourage people to go onto our Instagram to look at this photo. And Mike, if you, you're more than welcome to share this photo yourself, because um, we're particularly proud of this. This was at the end of the week of building the trench. Um, yeah. And we had Trevor, who um, worked hard on the digger, and we left him to it to dig out the, we, we planned out where the trench was going to actually uh, run. Okay. Had that, but then what, and he dug out sort of a primitive fire step for us. Um, and yeah, the guys worked really hard to get this fire step built. And now we've got, you can see wrinkly tin there, you can see sandbags, and of course the earth as well, compared to the chalk earth of, um, uh, of the previous trenches, this is far, which well, is a lot different, isn't it? It's full of flint. It's horrible stuff, really. It's horrible to work out. It's got great bits of flint in it. But the key thing about it is that um, when I've done archaeology in the area, we're talking about the real area, when you take the topsoil off, oddly, with a digger, uh, the first thing that you find is the top of the metal stakes that we can see there. Uh, you normally get they get damaged as you dig down but as soon as you found those you found the edge of your trench the rest of it is done by hand and immediately behind where our soldier is sitting the trench is deeper that's the walking area and that's supported by wooden a-frames and we built for this job um, about 20 of those a-frames to support what are known now as duck boards so what we've done is we've used the manuals the archaeology the ground and a, a little bit of cheating using a, a backhoe to recreate something that a soldier of the Great War would instantly recognize. In how, high line is, sorry, go ahead. Oh Mike. no, oh I did, just quick, quick and, and um, how wide is, is the trench? Uh, so my understanding is that the, you know, World War I trenches were always rather narrow and you had to like, you know, squeeze by the guy you're trying to get through, you know, and, um, but in, and I understand like in some films, I'm always you, you, the critic, maybe untrained critical eye. I'm always like, like yeah. gosh, aren't those trenches rather wide? But I understand probably for filming, you have to make it that way. So how wide are, are these trenches? If, if they're like by, by regulation, as you- Yeah, I mean, the, the, by regulation, they should be six foot six deep to the bottom, uh, which means that a six footer doesn't get shot in the head. Um, they are then going to be no more than about three foot to four foot wide at the top. The bigger they are, the more chance a shell will burst inside the trench. So they, they tried to ensure they weren't too wide. The Germans went for much wider trenches and much deeper trenches because they could win the war by staying where they were. And we know that because we excavated the Bayongraben, 
the Bavarian Trench at Serre, and people had said on social media when Warhorse came out, oh, those trenches were far too deep, far too wide, you know, they were never like that. Well, I remember standing in a, a trench cut in chalk, so in other words, it's a stone cut trench at the bottom, uh, and I could not see out. I got a periscope and I couldn't see out of that. In other words, frankly, if you had a horse, it would walk through it if it couldn't actually uh, run through it. It probably could be seen, but the idea that somehow films lie, it depends which trench or what point in the war, you know? And British trenches, we like narrow ones with really regular tops. The Germans think this is ludicrous. They dig deep trenches and they have very irregular tops to their trenches because their snipers can hide. It's just a different way of doing things. And there you have it really, is experimental archaeology. It's, it's yeah. recreating things, building things. And that, that's, that's where the learning comes in, understanding the differences, understanding why they did certain things. Yeah. Um, interesting fact as well for you there, the, the uh, film War Horse that Andy was indeed military advisor on, if you were to YouTube it, and I'll provide you with the link, Mike, that you can put in your cool. show notes, okay? Of the battle scene, they're going over the top. It's very emotional. Shells exploding everywhere. People are scared. Some people are facing facing the front, ready to do their duty. And then a man with bagpipes walks around the corner and an officer with a whistle in his mouth. And that officer is Andy Robertshaw. Okay. And he's there. You can, you'll recognize him by his moustache. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, that, that oh. might be it. They're pretty big, they're distinctive, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's no mistake yet. And yeah, you get a close-up, don't you? And you blow the whistle I and do. you lead them over the top. Yeah, I, I took direction from Steven Spielberg. How's that? Oh, that's not bad, is it? Isn't that something? Wow. Well, it took us seven takes, but let's not worry about that. They, they, they weren't all my problem. You know? <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's incredible. That's incredible. Um, all right. So how does, um, so going back to, to the site, so work yeah. is ongoing. Um, those pictures um, look, uh, they look great. Like you can really see, um, just how how kind of just dirty, ugly, you know, the yeah. scar running through the land. And um, so it's just like, so we've been talking about like the, the immersive experience of it all. And how does um how does the local community um, benefit from this? And and like how are how's the local community receiving the the new this new project in in their neighborhood? Well, I think we're about to do a, a number of bits of, of work for local media and, and national media. I think what it will do, it, it will actually bring to the fore the, the, the history of that ridge, that the, which kind of has been forgotten. People kind of know it as the Kent showground. They forget it as being Roman uh, signal towers and Morton Bailey castles. They forget about the, the, the Chatham land front of the First World War. There's a, a, a concrete pillbox on the edge of the motorway, the highway, um, built in 1917. People see it every day. They have no idea it's, it's not a Second World War pillbox. So I think it'll raise the, 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 the bar about what's happening in that area. Um, and the other thing it'll do, it, it will help to remind people that what people were doing in the UK, training was preparation for what would happen on the other side of the English Channel when they then went into action. Because the trenches that, that, that we're building, the techniques are exactly the same as they would use in railway wood. One of the uh, things that I'm really keen to do is to keep this local community aspect because people are so interested in local history. As Andy said, um, people see this uh, pillbox built in 1917 on the side of the A road and think, uh, and, and as I did until Andy told me, would just believe it's um, a Second World War pillbox. But of course, that just shows you how used to <laughs> pillboxes we are, which of course is a bizarre thing to think actually when you're not necessarily from the area. Again, talking about the geographical location of Kent. I mean, this place and particularly where we are in, 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 in uh, Kent Showground in Detlin, um, it, the place is littered with Germ uh, with um, defences uh, in case of a German invasion. And that in itself is a story which it would be a lie to say it's, it's, uh, it's never told, because of course it is. And I think it's one of the great what ifs of history to say, mm -hmm. what if the Germans invaded? There are films made about it and things. However, I think knowing the context of these pillboxes, knowing why they were there, Growing up in Essex, which is north of the River Thames and east, there's still, you know, the, it, it borders within the channel. 
I, I was also growing up accustomed to then seeing these pillboxes around and it wasn't until you give it some thought to think they, these are strategically placed <laughs> these are here for in case of, it's not just that they stuck them up in a farmer's field so they can use it as a cow shed you know this is a right. this this was built to defend um towns and really to stop the germans as long as possible from marching on london yeah the then from more of a international and national uh, aspects and community aspect I'm, we're really hoping to encourage people who are um, going to tour the battlefields um, to stop off and see us. Because I mean, for one thing as well, particularly coming over from the States, I'd imagine one of the choices is to fly into London. That's one of the, uh, either that or Paris, I, I assume. To fly into London, hire a car, you want to then drive to uh, the French and Belgian battlefields where you're gonna drive quite literally past our doorstep. So just think about that. You could go visit the battlefields and you can, uh, on the way there or on the way back, you can actually stop in and see a trench and how it was built and what it would have looked like. And it just, again, it, it's, it's not about replacing these tours. It's not about replacing traditional means of education or traditional battlefield tours. But just imagine coupling them both, coupling the, 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 the traces of war that you find in the battlefields and, and, and the, the, the research that can be done over there with a visceral aesthetic um, uh, experience like our trench system. Okay. I mean, it, it's worth saying that on the Western Front, most trenches are gone. They were swept away between the wars or just after the Second World War. There are a few exceptions. At Beaumont Hamel, uh, there you've got lumps and bumps in the field. The archaeological remains are now covered rather prettily with, with sheep grazing. Nothing at all like they were in 1916. Go to Vimy Ridge, the battlefield of 1917. The trenches there were replaced in concrete in the 30s. It, it, it's, it's, it's interesting, but it's misleading. By building the, 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 the trenches correctly with the correct material, it gives you an understanding of what they were like before you arrive on the other side of the channel, where there are nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Right. Especially I remember on uh, your uh, obligatory battlefield tour when you're 14 years old over here, which uh, certainly I haven't complained about. Um, I just read Michael Morpurgo's uh, private piece, and I just read Birdsong, of course, not as obligatory, but certainly it's a rite of passage, I think, for anyone starting in this subject. And as much as maybe my feelings on those uh, books have changed over time, certainly it captured my imagination, and I've got them to thank for that. I just remember, though, going over to the battlefield and, and um, finding it absolutely fascinating and, and probably the reason why I'm sitting here now, but struggling to imagine certain things that they're explaining. One thing I think that always um, springs to mind is when they talk about the Germans on the ridge, because I remember they're saying Germans on the ridge, I was almost imagining a cliff face of sorts, you know, really, you know, ridge, a vertical, you know, right up there in the sky, and there they are, the Germans towering down upon us. And of course, something that we've done with our trench site here is that we've taken the topography into account and we have put the German line on the higher ground not quite the ridge, but certainly the higher grounds. Well, so you hear about the higher ground, you hear about the Germans on the ridge. But of course, you know, when you're just walking around, it's, I mean, what, about a, a foot higher, perhaps? In... It's about a couple of metres at the most, at the most. Yeah. But of course, you know, it's a very gentle incline when you're just hanging about. But again, you get down into the trench, you look at, at their level, just pop your head over the parapet, and you can see all the difference it makes. Or vice versa, you go into our German line, and you look down on the Brits. And again, you know, you've got to keep your head down. It doesn't take much height to, to be able to look in and look down. And I think it's little things like that, which I certainly would have benefited from when I was uh, a bit younger. Or, and to be honest, I don't think age has anything to do with it. I think uh, sometimes our imagination needs a little bit of help. I mean, one of the things that you get is, you know, why do people in the First World War spend so long fighting for ridges? I mean, the battle for Hill 60, that, that hill is 60 metres above sea level. It's, it's not a mountain. Uh, so it's basically 60 yards high. Um, the key thing is the most effective weapon system in the Great War is not gas. It's not flamethrowers. It's not, not machine guns. It's a guy with a telephone. Because if on the end of the telephone there's an artillery battery, if he can see a target, he can destroy it. Right. So there's no point being halfway up a hill. Either you're at the top of the hill or you simply have no field of vision. So that's why battles like uh, the, the third battle of Ypres, Passchendaele, culminates taking the top of the ridge. Why in the Battle of the Somme people fight for ridge after ridge 
because the height gives you the ability to deal with the enemy effectively. Wow. It's again learning about these battles until you stand on the battlefields and you see the topography, you see why they were there and then have somebody explain uh, the positions. You can suddenly see, of course, of course, this was fought over so fiercely because it you know, you stand there and you can see everything. And, and I think it, it's even, these ridges are even more important. The fact that they're so subtle, they're even more important in landscapes like Northern France and Belgium because of the flat landscape. Every ridge counts, every every high, every piece of higher ground counts because as soon as you get that little bit higher um, off the ground, you can see for miles. And uh, yeah, certainly I think that couples quite nicely with um, what we're doing at our trench site. Uh, and Mike, can I just add in praise of of the Flemish authorities that 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 northern part of Belgium? I was involved in a project when they were going to extend a motorway, the A19. The A19 at the moment ends at a, a flyover near the city of Ypres. It just ends, nothing else. It's on a big embankment, probably about twelve yards high. Um, and what they did is they brought in people, including myself. We did. A sampling archaeologically on the route of the proposed motorway, very important for, for Belgian industry and trade. And at the end of it, a report was given to the Belgian governments, and they said if we put in a 12 meter high, um, 12 yard high embankment, it will hide the ridge which the battle was fought over. No, you can't build it. So they have simply said, in the interest of the heritage value of the battlefield, don't build a new highway. How about that? Wow, look at that. That's Here's an interesting point the, uh, that I learned only recently, again, through my um, university course, was Churchill, after the war, the first war, wanted to keep Eep as it was. A ruin. In, in, as a ruin. And of course, if you see the pictures of the place, you know, it was essentially uninhabitable. People, the people that were living there still were living in basements and that, you know, there, there was the house, I think, that was standing uh, proper. And he wanted to keep the whole thing as a as a ruin, as it was a shrine to what happened. I mean, a, a lovely thought, but of course, these poor people of Eve, they didn't want to come back. Of course, I think that was dismissed fairly readily um, by people of all sides. But then there was the debate of, right, are we going to rebuild Eep? Into something new. We have, you know, essentially we've had a, a city raised or a town raised to the ground that we can now rebuild in in, in modern ways and modern architectural means and, and for, to suit our benefit of the um, you know, 21st century needs, or we can uh, match it like for like to what it was uh, five years ago. And that's what they did. They did the second. And I think that's why for anyone who hasn't visited it, how, uh, how worthwhile it is to go is is for one. One of many reasons you can sort of stand there and look at the cloth hall and although it's been rebuilt you can think this is what it would have looked like right right uh, i'm and, I'm, I'm and the last bit that. of the cloth hall was finished in the 1960s it took that long really yeah yeah wow it's a big now, build on on your site you have um so you, you're talking about roman um uh roman norman roman and, and norman ruins um uh, but you also have, um, and uh, Mr. Robshaw, you're telling me about, I'm going to, this is how I wrote it down, was the, the concrete Lego pillboxes that will be a feature of the, yeah. the SEMA system. Can you tell us about, about that? Okay, well, what happened was, is that during lockdown, a group of local amateur archaeologists went to a beach in Kent, and they found sections of curved concrete, uh, which had been used in the Second World War to cover a pipe to set the sea on fire in case of Nazi invasion. It, that was what it was for. After the that's war, a story in itself, uh, isn't it? I mean, right? that's something it is. The pipe, but the blocks remained. But the blocks had been cast at a place called Richborough in Kent to go to the Western Front to build in an evening, a pillbox, literally like Lego blocks, like Lego, they all fit together in a circle. You need 48 of them to build one of these things. So they dig a pit and then the next night they build it and the next night they put the, the metal structure on it and automatically you build a pillbox. 
Well, these things at the end of the war were available and looks like lots of local authorities just bought them and they used them as edging for roads. They used them for edging of gardens and they used them in the Second World War on the beach. Because we then made a little bit of um, a TV about it, somebody uh, said, hang about, I know where there are 500 of these things. And they are then uh, all being well, we are gonna be able to recover at least enough to build two of these pillboxes. So our pillboxes won't be replicas, they will be the real thing, but rebuilt from blocks that were never used. They never got to France or Belgium. And I think what's so exciting about this is that they are concrete blocks. The, 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 what they look like sort of sitting in these farmer's fields or on the beach is you would never expect the type of history they've had, you know, the, the intentions of why they've had them, uh, what, why they were used, the fact that they were, you know, in the First World War meant, uh, meant to be brought over to build pillboxes to defend in, in a world war and in the second to set a sea on fire. You know? right. <laughs> these, these are just, and of course, no wonder people have just walked past them and, you know, they look like a pile of rubble, you know, yeah. I hate to say, you know, once put together, it's fantastic. And once you know the history, amazing. But, you know, it's, it's things like this where, God, it, it, fortunately, because I had no idea what these things were. Fortunately, you and the and and Phil, our, our colleague, and and a few and others realised, and Colin realised what they were and saved them. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the, the the landowner is selling the piece of ground that they're on, and they were going to go as landfill. So you know, we're, we're saving a bit of heritage. Never throw away your concrete, folks. Right, right. And by and by Colin, do you mean um, uh, Colin Wynn? No, this is Colin Varrell. Uh, oh, Colin okay. Varrell, okay. Who is um, uh, uh, descended from Kent Miners, uh, an author as well. Um, he's another Colin. He's, he's a paramedic. Oh, I see. Oh, awesome. In the British history world, Mike, you'll find there's a lot of Andes. There's a lot of Collins. Okay, <laughs> you've just got to. You've just got to wade your way through it. You know, I'm fortunate enough to be called Ross. And I think, yeah, actually, you know somebody else called Ross, don't you, Andy? So even that oh, isn't yeah, safe, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, a lot of Andy's, a lot of Collins suggest, yeah. Oh, my God, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, well, I have a question here of, like, um, how, how will you connect with younger audiences? But we we yep. clearly um, discussed that. Um, yeah, so... Uh, um, well, I mean, we, we could go on to, but if you don't mind, if I just say so, some of my plans. As creator director, self-titled. Yes, really. um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I do think genuinely my, 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 one of my passions is to try and engage as many different people as possible. And we're talking kids, but also people of all generation, because as I said to you, I think last week, I, there's a, a you know, I, I've, I've done bits and pieces on with through 8,000 foot media, my, my um, media company, usually with Andy and with, uh, always about the history, mostly about the, uh, the great war. A few of our videos have done all right. You know, we've got, best part of 20,000 views. So yeah. you can then on YouTube, you can see the analytics of your audience, mm -hmm. break it down. It's always fascinating. God, who's watching my videos? And it turns out it was the age, age no one under 45 was watching. So everyone who's been watching all of these 20,000 views, it was no one under 45 and 100% male. So I told my wife not to worry too much about, you know, me getting in trouble with any fangirls, all right? <laughs> That's not going to happen. But of course, right. more serious point, and particularly more recently, I think it's uh, it's worth, it's almost even more worthwhile um, uh, focusing on is the uh, is the idea of diversification to 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 try and make things that are interesting and accessible um, to everyone. Because I'm a firm believer that something like the Great War, there. It, it, the funny thing is you don't have to be a military historian to be interested in the great war you can be a cultural historian or you can be an anthropo uh, anthropologist you, you know there, there are so many different things you can do I, I believe that kind of most people can find an interest there whether it's just your own relative or, or, or whatever so with that in mind it is just trying to i think history has been left behind ironically um with when it comes to new technology if you look at Netflix and you look at some of the really stylish documentaries and things, you know, documentary, it was quite a, all right, Ken Burns did a lot of documentary about sort of 20, 30 years ago. But at the same time, it, it's, it's had its peaks and troughs and it and particularly, you know, your day-to-day -day TV style documentary or TV budget documentaries, they can be quite dry. Recently, oh boy, you know, th th there is some really, really good stuff, but history is never quite 
had that treatment yet, had the, I guess, the Netflix treatment, the yeah. uh, the 2020 treatment. Um, I'm really keen to do that, you know, and, that, and that's through the obvious means of Instagram and films and things, but also just, as I say, just they're, they're the, telling these stories that have been around for a hundred years in a different way that will engage with more people. Right, and even um, with with your site, um, I was thinking when you were um, when you were talking about the the, the Norman uh, Mott and Bailey, like just um, saying that like that something like that hasn't been built since since yeah. the, the the 11th century, and then just you guys, just your documenting the the construction of that, like what what a, what a content um, treasure yeah. right there. You know. I mean, if anybody is interested in this one, it just get a um, picture of the Bayer tapestry um, of the Normans building a Martin Bailey. You, you just go, if you let's go, Bayer tapestry, Martin mm -hmm. Bailey, M O T T E Bailey, B A I L E Y, you'll find it, it, it's in the embroidery, it's, it's a series of different colored lines which make no sense so you realize the actual mot is built as a series of lifts each with wooden planks in between it so what the the people who made the embroidery are doing are actually embroidering not a kind of artistic rendering of it they're going that's what it looks like with no grass on it it would look like look like a layer cake in different color material you know that's exactly what we're doing and that's what we want to show so case in point if you take that for example, you know, there's there's the project, there's the idea. We're going to build that. We're going to presumably learn things that we we don't know right now, and it's only through by by doing it we'll suddenly go, oh, okay, that's why they did that, or that's why it, it didn't work. Um, uh, I, I I'm relatively handy with a camera, so I, I, I tend to record everything that we do. Um, but then we'll put photos on Instagram. We'll speak to podcasts that people such as yourself who have certain interests with certain things, uh, uh, depending on the uh, on the period. Um, you know, will invite university students to come and, and, and do their own research or to help us with our research and then the idea being then our website will likely be the most centralized part yeah. of us where we can then provide a project with various strands so if you're interested in more of the visual aesthetic uh, film side of things you've got that you've got your documentary you've got your short instagram videos but you've also got the academic paperwork that you'll be able to download you've got the uh the audio library you've got the 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 background behind it you'll have you know i'd like to do interviews with andy that's one of the things that we seem to do best he, i call him one take andy you point a camera at him and he can just he, he reels a full kind of information but it's that that kind of thing i think one project is not enough to do then one uh, tell it in one way there are many different ways we can tell it and of course we're, we're in an age where the multimedia is is yeah. so accessible it's it's a shame not to do it and something's just, just popped into my head. It should have been there before. I don't know why it wasn't. For, for people with an interest in 1066, when the Normans arrive, they actually brought with them a, I kid you not, a prefabricated fortification. They brought with them the wooden tower that went on the mot. They brought it with them. They built it in France. They put it on the ship. They brought it ashore and they built it. Now, in 1917, the British army is going the other way to help the French rather than the French invading, taking with us prefabricated things we built in the UK to build in France. Now, isn't that incredible? There's to think that actually we can mirror both ends of that process. The Normans with their prefab castle and us with our prefab uh, actual um, pillbox going the other opposite direction. What a, what a, Oh my God. It's a story in that, isn't there? You, you, know, you can see, you can see the interesting narratives that come from it. It's great. And we, we encourage, talk, your question about engaging with the local community, I really, really want to encourage then local filmmakers, photographers, artists, writers, academics, all the rest of it to, to come and, and do their own projects with us, you know, because we're, we're just as keen to hear from them. We, we don't want to do all the legwork, you know. We we're certainly want to be the driving force behind it and we have our own passion projects and things like that. But if somebody has an idea, um, and they think it's something that can be done here. We encourage people to come to us and, uh, with their ideas and see if it's something we can work on together because yeah. the, the fact is we want to make all of this information available to everybody um, in various different ways. So the more information, the better. Awesome, awesome. So to, I guess to, to <clears throat> kind of um, wrap, wrap things up. So you're, you broke ground recently. You're, yep. you're working on the site. Are you, are you already op open to visitors you know with, with pandemic conditions or or are you is that going to be a bit 
um, delayed because of the work or, or because of the, the pandemic or? I, I think w w things get a little easier for us as from Monday, from the 12th uh, uh, of, of April. Uh, however, what we need to do is we need, we're building at the moment to, for the needs actually of filming that will occur um, at the end of May, beginning of June. We've then got an open day, which is the key date, which is the 26th of June, which is Armed Forces Day. You can see why we picked that day. Um, right. Then we're going to have something bigger than as a, an opening for schools uh, in September when schools go back at having had the summer break. That's the plan. I think I haven't missed anything there, have I, Ross? No? I, I mean, I'd say other than that, we're doing the, uh, is it the great... Tommy Sleepouts, is that the name? Oh, yes, yes. We, we've got Royal British Legion uh, doing a fundraiser and they wanted to do a great Tommy Sleepout. One of my colleagues spent a month, ex-soldier, sleeping outside, raising money for soldiers or servicemen and women who are rough sleeping. Um, but they wanted to do something perhaps aimed at CEOs of companies and we're talking about doing something with them on site but we, we need to get the restrictions due to COVID reduced so we can do that, the sleep out. Right. Of course, we'll have plenty of time. And, you know, and I think that's it. We'll wait until COVID and everything else is... is and we'll let you know gone. about it. Yeah. Absolutely. Because really, the, what we want is people who are keen to, if they want to, dress up as a First World War soldier and sleep in a trench for the night yeah. to raise money. I'm How's in. that? I'm in. And Mike, you, you need to come down. You, what you need to do, you need to come down and record a podcast from a trench. That would be oh a my, first, wouldn't it? What an amazing idea. Yes, yes. Yeah. You'd be more than welcome. And I think, you know, your next time you're on your way to the battlefield, you've got to come down and record, yeah, record from the trench. And, yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, do, do whatever kind of projects you fancy doing. It's it's actually, so two years ago, my my wife and my daughter, we we took a trip to London, we spent a week there. Um, I did a week, they, they did too. And I, you know, love the city and um, would very much like to go back. So I think um, my next, you know, once restrictions lift and we, we get back over, over across the pond, like, I think I need to stop in London and make my way over and, you know, and then, and then I can take a, a, a ferry across over to France, but I definitely, what a, what a great idea of record a podcast. Well, I mean, what, what we'll do, if you like, is we'll act as your guide. So you can walk in the, the footsteps of Malins. We can do all sorts. That's right. I mean, that's something that's, that, that, that's probably worth mentioning is with the centre is, is that uh, as well as being a stopping off point um, on the way to the battlefields um, is <laughs> plugging Andy's work here. He does a cracking tour, but more so is it, what, you, what you'll have is, is at the centre various knowledgeable people yeah. who are keen as mustard to get out to the battlefields and so uh you know for depending on what's going on it will be would likely run tours um of our own uh starting at the site and then going off onto the battlefields we we uh, andy has as we say the uh, his tour of uh called in the footsteps of malins about jeffrey malins the cameraman who our film um beaumont hamlet is based on um, on the song but you know it, there's, there's there's a lot of things like that so yes Mike you're more than welcome and so are yeah. all your listeners and uh, I recommend if you go onto our website so that's www.cema.education -E um, I'm currently doing the website but there's a landing page that if you then put your email into our newsletter I promise I won't spam you but what I will do is I'll just give you a few updates about how things are going um, and uh, like that you guys can keep abreast of the news and once you come over here you know where to find us awesome, awesome. and obviously to keep things on, on an even le level what we need to do in london if you're there is i'll take you on a, a um we'll go do a bit of mudlarking we'll go look at the, the force shore of the thames at low tide otherwise you get wet uh we'll look we'll, what hasty we can find there and then i'll take you to one if not two of the oldest pubs I I in england um which are, are worth going to um, that's another one of Andy's tours. It's the Andy Robertshaw pub crawl. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about Rich, here's one for you. You're saying in, encouraging people to do, bring their own projects and, and, and to us and, and to do things. Um, uh, my wife is a brewer. She brews beer. Uh, she's American. Um, she's, you know, you, I know your craft beer um, over your way is just fantastic. And it's um, similar over here, although we have perhaps less of an emphasis on IPAs. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she, what, her idea, which uh, I think, Andy, you were 
very happy with the idea of, is to do to do uh, a pub crawl through the ages so think of this you you, you come and you do a pub crawl with uh, sam and, and us you start in the morning drinking an authentic roman beer with with roman soldiers or you know roman peasants and you end it drinking uh i don't know a beer in a foxhole with a with a second with a, I don't know, a paratroop or something we haven't, we haven't worked out the details but you see the point you know beers through the ages and brewed I've, historically accurately brewed oh my god take take, take my money now right okay. yeah. Yeah. he's worth saying that a local uh, brewery provided the first beer flown to normandy after d-day oh, it really? actually went in the the, the, the the brand new drop tanks of a spitfire um, and they filled it with beer and not actually with fuel. And he took it and it was the first beer to arrive in there. So we're going we're gonna to get the brewery to make some more of that beer. Just thought of that as well. That's stunning. Okay. Wow. This is just, <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. <laughs> this is history you can taste, okay? Yeah, that's it. I mean, the problem is we haven't actually tasted what a Roman beer. I mean, I presume there was, some, maybe not beer, I would have called it beer, but I presume there was something... Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Um, it'll be one of those things it's all a great idea until you taste it and you, oh god <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> it might be. i'm gonna stick to my ipa so i think you that's know, IPA. Thing. Yeah, like. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's excellent wow gentlemen thank thank you thank great, you guys thank you so much for for taking the time out of your your saturday to um to, to come on and and talk and and um just how like just just share your new project and and the the enthusiasm and, and everything that that goes into it um yeah thank you thank you guys so much and and do keep us updated um, um i know the the podcast has a uh, i believe it has a fairly significant um uh, number of uk listeners so i think this this um this, this will help to just just spread the word around around the uk for you so Excellent. Brilliant. Thank wow. you. It's, yeah, we, we really appreciate um, being able to um, come on. I mean, certainly, I think uh, we need to come up with some kind of joint project. Um, yeah. If there's something we, we can think or something you're keen to do. Sure. You know, and, you know, sure. I'd be more, more, more than happy yeah, to yeah, actually to facilitate. But as in, I think, yeah, a SEMA and Battles of the First World War podcast collaboration oh. of sorts. If you can think of anything, do let us know. Yes. Yes. I've got to work in my um, my as you guys know, like my my. Portuguese heritage so who knows maybe 24 hours in a in a Portuguese trench no <laughs> something like that <laughs> well certainly I mean you know it'd be fascinating if, if that's something you want to do it'd be a fascinating area wouldn't it I mean yeah. I can see Andy Andy's thinking something now I can see he's thinking yeah, no, something. I've, I've got a friend who lives in uh, Lisbon some of the year and he's a big collector of Portuguese equipment so we might have a chat okay Ooh. Again. Oh, watch out. You're going to be put, put in uniform and stuck in a trench before you know it. <laughs> I, listen, gentlemen, like I, I work for free. So it's right. like, just put me in the uniform. I'll, I'll be the, I'll do my best. So <laughs> it's awesome. Well, wow, thank you guys so much. Uh, all right. So we will, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be in touch. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank and you I'll, very much. Thank you, Mike. And I'm just going to stop recording.